Today we're going to be talking about crime and punishment and how I believe that our local governments and our state government is failing miserably in this area, creating more victims and creating a much bigger crime wave than we need to be experiencing right now. It's personal to me now, and I think when you hear this, it's going to be personal for you as well. Thank you for watching. My name is Glenn Morgan, and this is We the Governed. Now, listen, I don't usually talk about crime and punishment. Uh, I don't know why I haven't necessarily done that as a public policy issue, but I tend to get into wonkish details of all kinds of issues, property rights, you know, how the voting system works, uh, corruption in government, all kinds of things. But uh, I have a personal reason why this has become uh, higher on my radar, and I'm guessing that many of the people who are watching this video will have it fairly high on theirs as well. And part of it for me is just the fact that, as I mentioned before, and as I've linked to the story down below, I was involved recently in some serial criminals that came onto our property and uh, one of them, one of whom threatened me and attacked me. And so uh, this could have gone a lot worse than it did. And as I promised before in a previous video, I will tell the story pretty soon. But for now, I just want to say that that, of course, has triggered a lot more attention on my part into deciding what the heck's actually going on in our criminal justice system here where I live in Thurston County. And of course, one of the concerns I have is when you run into multiple serial felons who I did the background checks on them and these guys were bad guys. They've been victimizing uh, people in our community and surrounding communities in the state, down into even Oregon, for decades. All these guys do is wake up every day, apparently, and find ways to go out and hurt and harm and attack people. Looking at their criminal history include extortion and assault and robbery and burglary, drug charges, of course, all kinds of other issues. Um, these are not good people. These are terrible people, and they're victimizing so many people all the time. And why the heck were they still able, after being arrested dozens and dozens of times, to still be able to go out there and, and be on our property and try to attack me. Well, unfortunately, this is all they do. <laughs> These guys, and I wish I could say they're alone, but they aren't. This is all they're doing. And I'm going to point out right now that as bad as these guys were, they were arrested by the police and they were taken away. Despite that, one of them did go to the hospital and the other one went to, went to jail, presumably. But they're right back out on the streets because they're doing this right now. Now, one of them, his arm may not work so well right now, but as long as they can and as far as they're able to, they're going to apparently be going out and just victimizing people like they have done for every day of their lives, as far as I can tell, for the last 30 or 40 years. And that's just based on the criminal history. And of course, they're just making more and more victims everywhere they go. Now, I want to point out one of the things that kind of frustrated me here was that one of the reasons why they were released, because there's still the potential for charges to pen pending against them, is that there's over 3,000 felony cases that are basically sitting in the queue in Thurston County Courts. And I think if you look where you live, you're going to find that there's a massive backlog of felon cases where you live, of significant people doing really bad things, and the prosecutor either is unwilling or just doesn't have the resources to deal with it properly. And it raises a lot of public policy questions and also questions about how we want to deal with these issues where we live, because otherwise this is all these guys are going to be doing. They aren't always going out and assaulting somebody or attempting to attack somebody like happened to me. They might just be spending their time breaking into your car while it's parked somewhere. They do get arrested. Otherwise, they wouldn't have criminal history. I mean, the police, I think, are doing the best job they can in most cases. And even though there's been this effort to defund the police and attack the police that the Democrats have had in our state and Democrat elected officials have repeatedly done that, uh, despite that, they are doing a decent job trying to catch these criminals. But it's a catch and release issue. They catch them, they bring them into jail, maybe they get charged or maybe they don't. Or in like the case that I've, I'm experiencing right now, they're just out there running around doing their thing. And uh, even when they have been arrested in the past, because some of them have gone to jail. The two guys that uh, were on our place, they've been in jail before. Uh, within a very short period of time, they seem to be released so that they can come out and do more things. I'd rather see them in places like this right now. That's where they belong. But instead, they just, they're warehoused for just a short period of time, and then rapidly released so they can continue to victimize you and I and our neighbors and our community. And when they come out of the prison or jail, the, there's zero interest in changing their direction. Especially after they've done this four, five, two dozen times, do you really think they're going to change? If anything, they just get worse. And that's the experience that I've had personally now. And that's the experience that a lot of people watching this video have had, and I guarantee everybody watching this video knows somebody who's been victimized by serious crime. And this is a real significant issue that we're going to have to address. 
Now, I want to point out, just from a public policy standpoint, this issue has kind of been, I, I've, I've always been interested in it, but it uh, hasn't been something that I've been talking about so much lately. But I did go to Columbia University, despite being a fifth generation Washingtonian. You can read my bio if you want to know more down below. Uh, oddly enough, I ended up going back to New York City, and that's the college I went to. And it's funny, but, uh, but it's funny if you know how left-leaning that college is and how much of a conservative activist I am, but that's the school I went to. And I was in a sociology class uh, that I was taking, and I remember my sociology professor was teaching a very left-leaning uh, approach to how to deal with criminals, basically that uh, you know they're just misunderstood and let's release more of them into the community, et cetera, et cetera. And so she wanted to know if anybody was willing to debate the position that she had in the classroom and uh, represent a different perspective than the big, massive reading list that she had given to us. And so I volunteered to do so along with a friend of mine who was actually uh, a foreign student that was going to Columbia at the time from the Dominican Republic. And so both of us believed that the criminal justice system needed to be more assertive when it came to dealing with bad criminals, especially when it came with the social compact and how people need to realize that there's some uh, result in committing lots of bad crimes, that there needs to be some crime and punishment element to it. But at the time, there was no internet. I didn't have access to a lot of other resources, so I had to go to the library at Columbia University, and that is where I discovered, totally by accident and incidentally, I discovered two books that were written by James Q. Wilson at the time, Crime and Human Nature and Thinking About Crime. Now, because of course these were never assigned in class, I had to read these myself and be able to come up with my arguments in class. And I don't know that I can say that I won that debate. Uh, most of the students were screaming at me and it was very hard to get things out. And the professor, to her eternal credit and to my thankfulness, actually appreciated the fact that there were a couple students up there uh, who were willing to make a different argument than the dominant position that she had presented in class. I don't think many professors today are willing to do that, but I was very fortunate back then. Debate was still allowed on campus, and I was allowed to debate this issue. And I'm going to point out that when I lived there, my sophomore year, there were 2,605 murders in New York City, majority of those within about 10 miles of my dorm room. That is a horrific level of crime and victimization that was going on all around me. I was in shock as a kid from the Pacific Northwest, suddenly thrown into an area where there was so much mass crime going on, and it was very much a sense of lawlessness. One of the things I did when I was at uh, when I was there at school, one of the last things I did is I brought uh, Rudy Giuliani to campus to speak. He was actually playing; he was running for governor, and, or I'm sorry, for mayor. And he, I brought him in to speak on campus. And shockingly, because I was already gone, I'd left the city by this time and gone home. He was actually elected mayor in 1993, which was stunning. Nobody expected that a Republican being elected in a dominant Democrat city like. New York City, and nevertheless, he was elected. And I still attribute a lot of that to the fact that this crime was absolutely unbelievable. And the most amazing thing, even more amazing than him getting elected, was the fact that crime dropped by over 66% or more, depending on how you categorize it, uh, in the city. And murders in particular dropped dramatically. I mean, it dropped way back down below to the 1960s levels that most people weren't alive to even experience back then. And that is amazing as the murder rate dropped lower, lower, lower each year as he implemented a lot of James Q. Wilson's influenced issues. The broken windows theory is the most common. Community policing is one of the issues that people have talked about. But part of it also just involved taking real criminals and making sure you get them off the streets. It isn't that difficult of a concept. And yet, what we're seeing today, despite the experience I personally had in that city of watching the, just the anarchic lawlessness that existed there at the time, uh, as, is that even today now we see the same absurd, stupid ideas that led to that original crime wave in New York City in the 70s and the late 60s, 70s, and the, and the 90s, early 90s, until Giuliani got in. We saw it happen in, um, in other cities like Detroit. We saw it happen in plenty of other cities, and now we're seeing it happen even in the city of Seattle over just absurd and ridiculous policies being put by leftists at all times, and it's exclusively pushed by only one party. You can't say this with everything. Uh, when it comes to taxes, generally, uh, Democrats like higher taxes. It's almost always true, but not always. Sometimes Republicans are willing to jump in bed with them and keep uh, jacking up taxes for their own purposes, too. We, have, we see that problem sometimes. But when it comes to this issue, 
Uh, it has been spearheaded almost exclusively by the left wing of the Democratic Party. We see this in the local elected officials, and we see it at the state level with several ridiculous and absurd laws that have been passed that have eliminated the ability of police to chase criminals, that have uh, basically caused all kinds of problems with early release of felons, and even discussions about taking the 19,000 some odd felons that currently exist in the prison system in Washington and getting, you know, pulling 3,000 or 4,000 of them out early. Now, I'm going to tell you that idea right now is probably dead in the water during an election year, but the same clowns that kind of thought that was a good idea, some of them are still in the state legislature, and I'm sure that in their hard hearts, they talk about it and they're trying to find some way to finagle it or convince Inslee to implement another absurd level of the policy changes that, that have occurred to make us far less safe and far more at risk. Now, people have talked about the Cloward Piven idea that this uh, political strategy driven kind of by a left-leaning approach about kind of crashing the system and creating more chaos and drama and causing social order breakdown. And I want to point out that Cloward and Piven, these were uh, Columbia University professors uh, when I was there. I don't remember ever taking a class from Richard Cloward. I just, for some reason, I remember him being there. I just don't remember ever taking a class from him. I'm sure he would have failed me if I did. Uh, I don't, you know, that's just the way it would have would have been. But uh, I put up a picture here because this is uh, Francis Fox Piven, to whom he was married, and Richard Clow uh, Cloward. Uh, they were actually, this photo was taken in 1993 when they were at the Motor Voter Act law that was signed into place by uh, uh, Bill Clinton in 1993. So I want to point out that uh, these guys were heavily involved in a lot of the policies that seem to have resulted in a lot of negative things for a long time. And they wrote extensively about these different ideas of overwhelming the system, of crashing public order and causing all kinds of problems. It's always couched in this diversity, inclusion, equity idea, the die agenda. But nevertheless, it's a real serious serious problem that we have, and it's led to some significant issues, I think, as it's implemented into public policy locally. Now, when it comes to Washington state, if you actually read our state constitution and you look at Article 9, Section 1, it says that it's the paramount duty of the state to make ample provisions for the education of all children residing within its borders. And now, we see this repeated endlessly, endlessly, endlessly all the time with the McCleary decision and other issues where the, uh, those who are the political beneficiaries of this cash, which is oftentimes the teachers union and a lot of the grifters that kind of exist in the, in the public sector education world, they keep emphasizing this and pushing this at all times, that this is the paramount duty. I had a debate a while ago, it was a number of years ago, with a judge in Thurston County, uh, not a Superior Court judge, I've been in court there so often that I think at the time I was actually in court in every single court room in Thurston County, so I couldn't talk to any Superior Court judges, but it was a District Court judge. And I remember pointing out that I disagreed with this statement because I believe the actual paramount duty of the state is to ensure public safety, and that means that you have the ability to actually enforce the laws fairly and timely and in a way that ensures that people aren't being victimized regularly by violent criminals and felons all the time. And it's done in a way that is actually processes the people through the system. It fairly treats them. It gives them a plate for criminals to go. It, it, the entire system needs to exist because otherwise if you have public disorder and uh, terrible violence and all the things that we see happening more and more right now, not just in Washington state, a number of states are experiencing the same thing, especially the cities, um, then you're, the paramount duty for education, you're not going to get any education at that time because people are going to be suffering much more significant consequences as their homes are broken into, their cars are being stolen, uh, kids' futures being damaged because their parents are being harmed so significantly, or the kids are being hurt, and uh, the, that's a pretty significant and traumatic thing for people to go through. And I think that it's important that we recognize that the paramount duty of government is to ensure the laws are actually honestly and equally enforced, that individual rights are protected, and part of that protection is to ensure that when criminals are coming out and causing great harm to you and they're caught, that they're actually prosecuted to the extent that the law allows and it would be appropriate in that case. And I think violent serial felons should not be running amok in the community like we're seeing happen right now, because there is such a thing as... <laughs> There is a good place for them to go. I think that the best place for serial felons is and should be behind bars. Because at least while they're there, they're not able to victimize the rest of us. And I fully support the three strikes and your outlaw, especially if it's applied to people that are just these serial felons continually, continually out there victimizing people in the community. I mean, after all, right now you can steal a car almost nine times and get caught before you even serve any significant time in jail at all. And you might only get a year at that point in time. To many people, a vehicle, to, especially to lower income people, that's the second most expensive thing they've ever purchased. They've spent a lot of time and money to get that car, and that may be their only way to get to work, take their family around, and now that's gone. 
And people that are caught doing that on a regular basis, nothing happens to them. People that go and burglarize their homes and attack them or assault them on the streets are right back out on the street again. And half the time, like we're seeing in, in Thurston County and elsewhere, the prosecutors are so overwhelmed that they're not even able to prosecute those guys. And they just allow them to continue to go out there all the time. We really need to look at this and look carefully at how it's being implemented and the foolish agenda and the esoteric sort of lefty approach to unleashing crime into our communities to destroy the lives of so many people, how bad that public policy is and how we don't need more of it. We don't need to purposely create more victims. As much as it appears the left wants everybody to be a victim, we don't need to purposely create more victims by unleashing these violent felons into our communities. It's public policy that is absurd. And I don't find them admitting that this is what they're doing so much, but this is exactly what they're doing. This is an inevitable result of the policies they have. Just look at the former, pro the current prosecutor in King County. I swear to God, this, this is the guy's idea of just unleashing criminals wherever he possibly can, as often as he can, causing great harm. It's going to matter who you elect to be prosecutor in King County. When, Dwayne, uh, when um, uh, the new prosecutor was actually elected in Seattle, uh, that was, I think, sometimes a, a reflection of the people's concern about this tendency to keep pushing more felons out into the street, causing more, prime, uh, more problems and more crime. The Democratic Party is probably not going to want to highlight the fact that their defund the police efforts and their effort to be soft on crime and to release more criminals into our community and ensure that these criminals are just going to come back and continue to prey on people all the time, they're going to probably downplay that right now. Several of the politicians who supported it are getting really nervous because all the polls show, at least in Washington state, that people are sick of it and they don't want to see more of it. And yet, all those ideas come from this party. It does matter who you vote and who you put into office. I think that crime and punishment and the public policy issues that surround it are going to be a significant factor for us to deal with as a community. We have to find a way to revisit what has been well-known, well-proven from the days long decades ago, long before I was born, when James Q. Wilson was first doing some of his studies about why is it that just a teeny fraction of the population commit the vast majority of the crimes, and how do you deal with that? And we can find solutions. It's been done before. We don't have to continuously go down this experiment that the left wants us to go down, where I think so many more people are going to be victimized by crime, and criminals are emboldened and encouraged to just go out and victimize more people. We don't need that. We don't need what happened to me to be happening to you. And uh, I hope that we're able to look at some of this public policy and recognize that there is a need to make changes. And I'm also going to point out, and I'll just show you here right now, is I have been a fan of a lot of these uh, initiatives that you see reflected at Let's Go Washington. I'm going to attach this link down below. Don't have any doubt as to my motivation of why I'm pushing these. These are good ideas. And the first three specifically here on public safety, uh, they address some of these issues, not all of them. It's just the beginning. But we need to get out there and tell our elected officials that these issues matter. Sign these initiatives, find the locations and get them signed. Send a message to the legislators and to the community that these things matter, and they do. We have to make these changes. So for that, I want to thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, again, uh, if you want to learn more, go to wethegovern.com. Uh, link down below. I've linked a lot of uh, articles that are kind of related to this or that I reference in, in this video down below. Feel free to leave a comment if you think I'm entirely wrong or you support it, me. But uh, either way, I'll try to, I try to read those comments pretty frequently and get back to you on it. And uh, just remember that if you do want to make a difference, I believe you have to show up because the future belongs to those who show up.